Did the recent streak of Starship failures change my confidence in SpaceX's future success? How can we measure the rotation of gas giant planets? Is there a chance the Voyagers can make another pale blue dot image? And in our Q&A Plus extended version, do we have a moral obligation to spread life into the universe? It's time for the question show. Your questions, my answers, as always, wherever you are, across my channel, if a question pops in your brain, just write it down. I'll gather them up and I'll answer them here. All right, let's get into the questions. Tremola Soul, could we turn Voyager around again to take another picture for Carl Sagan? Oh, that would be great. Um, but no. Uh, yeah, like the pale blue dot and the and the and the essay that Carl Sagan wrote for the pale blue dot is just like it's one of the most meaningful pieces of space related philosophy that you can ever read, right? That and it's really profound that you're looking at this little blue speck, this couple of pixels, and that's planet Earth. Everybody's lived and died. Everybody, you know, they're on that little speck. And it is a tiny speck in the larger universe. It's quite an amazing picture. But no, unfortunately, uh, they've, you know, because of the power, they've cut down the amount of power. And I don't even know the Voyagers could even take a picture and spot the Earth. So they're just they're so far away now and running low on power. There's very little that they can do at this point beyond sort of surf through the interstellar wind and experience the, uh, you know, the charged particles that are flowing past them and then send that science back home to Earth. Amar, I'm going to be sad when the Voyagers eventually stop communicating. Is there a way we can still check on the status of the Voyagers without needing to receive anything from them? So I th originally, I thought you were asking, like, is there a way to check on the status of the Voyagers? And you can check on the status of the Voyagers. You can go to the website uh, for the Voyager spacecraft. Just do Voyager mission NASA. You'll get the status of the mission. So Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, they had 47 years and nine months. Voyager 1 is 166 astronomical units away from Earth. Voyager 2 is 139 AU from the Earth. It's 23 hours one way light time to get to Voyager one. And then they tell you the instrument status, the mission status, so you can find out kind of everything that's going on, which instruments they've had to turn off to save power and when uh, so you can find all that out. Will humanity be able to maintain contact with the Voyagers once they run out of power? No. The only way we know what's happening with them is because they have enough power to transmit their existence back to Earth. And as soon as they run out of that power, uh, I'm sure just before that moment, when they're just about out of power, NASA is going to give them the go to sleep command. And then both of those spacecraft will carefully shut off and put into safe mode all of their instruments and then turn themselves off for the last time. And then they'll be quiet and just drifting out into the Milky Way for hundreds of millions, maybe even billions of years until the cosmic radiation and intergalactic dust grinds them down into powder. Blasty, I wonder how long it'll be before journals are flooded with AI generated research. It is already starting to happen. Um, you know, like on the on the easy side, you can get the AI to rewrite your text and clean up the language and fix the grammar, fix the spelling. So I wouldn't be surprised if Almost every team at this point is using some kind of large language model to tune up their writing. But also people have found all kinds of stuff that was absolutely created by LLMs. You know, ChatGPT was writing chunks of a journal article. And, you know, like, as long as the data are good, I don't think it really matters that you're having all this extra stuff written by ChatGPT. Like what really matters, you know, it helps you communicate your actual true valid ideas. I think that's fine. Um, you know, it's the question is that if you use the ChatGPT to make up data, to make up sources, then we've got a problem. So, uh, yeah, I think right now it's already and like I'm sure scientists like are a huge percentage of them are already using this stuff just because it saves them time. But they have to know when to draw the line and say, this is what it's good for. And this is what it's bad for. Uh, you know, like at, at Universe Today, I use ChatGPT and stuff to help me with research. 
where I'm, you know, helping help. It's, you know, helping me understand a very complex paper or something like that. But I would never let it write for me. Right. Like, that's my job. I'm the writer. Uh, I, I'm not going to publish one word of something that ChatGPT spat out. Uh, it's not just redundant. It's poorly written. Vinny Cartini, when we measure wind speeds on gas giants, what is it relative to? It's not the ground because there is none. How do you distinguish wind from the rotation of the planet? So the way you measure the rotation of a planet in general is you put a spacecraft in orbit, or you watch from the Earth and you watch how long it takes for features on the surface of that planet to return to the same spot. And that's what you do for Mars, for example, is you just wait until the same feature is returned back to the same spot that tells you the day length on Mars, very easy to do day length on Mercury, very easy to do Venus, a little tougher, but they figured it out. But with the gas giants, it is indeed tricky. Now with Jupiter, you've got some specific storms, as you can see how long the storms take to return to the same spot. But the storms are turning at in some cases, hundreds of kilometers per hour moving, you know, the bands on Jupiter, are counter rotating. And so one band is going this way, the next band down is going that way. And the storms are, are turning within those bands. And so what like what, is, what does it mean? So the way they measure the rotation rate of gas giants is through the magnetic field. So while the the surface clouds will be changing, the magnetic field of the planet is very specific, and it turns at this very specific rate. And so when you have spacecraft in orbit around Jupiter, like the Juno spacecraft, or the Galileo spacecraft, they were able to measure the turn the turning of the magnetosphere, and then use that to perfectly time. And so then the wind speeds are, you know, if you imagine that it is a solid sphere, uh, that is turning at the way the magnetic field is telling you that it's turning, then the winds are going relative to that rotation. And that's how they measure it. It's time to shout out our new patrons at the $5 level and above Steve Hoff, Insane Mingo, Ronak, Lulius Cheezar, Ark Turuxub, Jumpmaster, Jerry, Benjamin Whiteman, Andy Briggs, and Jacques Pelletier. Join our community at patreon.com slash universe today. Wishmaster Brazen, have you lost any faith in SpaceX with their current track record and the recent explosion? I find myself less and less confident about them achieving their goal. You know, I have been reporting on SpaceX right from the very beginning, the first launch of the Falcon 1, the work through the Falcon 9, the development of the Falcon Heavy. And I remember the announcement in 2016 of the BFR, which was the original name for uh, Starship. And so here we are nine years later, um, and we've seen a bunch of tests. And so, you know, have I lost faith? I never really had a lot of faith. I believe that SpaceX is going to figure this out. You know, creating a fully reusable two stage rocket is would be an incredible achievement and that it would dramatically change the way rockets are launched um, and cargoes are carried to space and that you would see a dramatic decrease in launch costs and you would eventually see the entire launch market shift over to this concept. I'm kind of amazed that nobody else has really caught up to SpaceX with just the Falcon 9. Like they're just demonstrating reusability of those of those rockets. And so, you know, we've now seen Super Heavy return to the launch pad, get caught. We've seen Starship safely ish pass through the atmosphere and land with pinpoint accuracy in the ocean. At this point, it's an engineering challenge. And I think the the part that I've always found unnecessary and unrealistic is just the claims about how long this is going to take and how and how easy it's going to be and how many rockets are going to be launching and how incredible this is all going to be like it's it's really hard and it's going to take a long it's going to take as long as it takes but it's probably going to take a long time and I think if this is your first rodeo with the CEO of SpaceX, then you buy into the hype. 
But if this is not your first rodeo with the CEO of SpaceX uh, and you went through the hype over the Falcon 9 and the hype over the Falcon Heavy and how long that was supposed to take uh, and the development of the Dragon and the development of like all this stuff, like it all just takes time. And, you know, we always used to call it Elon years, right? That that he would say something's going to happen in two years and you double and add 10, right? Like, that's just, that's just how this rolls. Like, I know that there are tons and tons of engineers and they are really talented and they're working on a really worthy goal that's going to change the future of spaceflight. And they're having to deal with a CEO who is distracted and not doing his job. They're going and doing other things. And yet, I'm sure... Uh, is putting a lot of pressure on the people back at SpaceX to deliver on the goals that he's setting, the unrealistic goals, the promises that he's making. And if everybody just relaxes, stop making all these promises, just, just focus on developing an incredible platform, put it through its paces, develop re, you know, reusability and reliability, then the customers will come because this thing will be a total game changer. So... You know, it's sort of like it's not about the core engineering challenge that feels like it's been solved or it has been is on the pathway to being solved. It's everything else around it. So, you know, I think that's the part that that's the part that's made me, I don't know, lost faith, just numb. I just don't care anymore. Right. Like it's just too much shenanigans. I just don't care anymore. So, you know, we report on it. But I report on it in the way that I report on a United Launch Alliance launch or a European Space Agency uh, launch of a satellite, right? Like it's, like it's not, oh my God, this is game changing. I'm super excited. Like I just am not excited about it anymore. And I just don't put a lot of mind power into thinking about how I'm going to report on it. So yeah, that's me. That's my perspective. Uh, but, you know, at the same time, you know, when they successfully catch Starship back at the launch tower, that'll be amazing. When they actually start carrying payloads into orbit and then retrieving things and landing back at the launch facility, that'll be amazing. And if they actually are able to send something off to Mars, that'll be amazing. And if they send something to the moon, that'll be great, too. But I think, you know, they're pushing for a 2026 launch window. Why? Just just wait till it's ready and then just launch it. You know, I haven't reported once that Musk has said that they're going to launch to Mars in 2026 because I know it's not going to happen, right? So why bother? Like, I'll just wait until that the Starship has gone through all the tests. It's sitting on the launch pad. This is the rocket that's going to go to Mars. I'll report on that. But I'm not really going to report on the, on the stuff that he says because these things take longer. And uh, it's better to just wait and report on things that actually have happened. Church discography, what's taking New Glenn so long? Yeah, I. who knows? I mean, like, how can you really know unless you are like right in there and there at the meetings and seeing all the stuff that's happening? So, you know, same thing. Like, I'm sure Jeff Bezos is incredibly frustrated at the slow pace. This is not what he wanted for New Glenn. And they've seen one test flight and they didn't test the reuse of the booster. So maybe we're going to see another test this summer and they're hoping to get to eight flights a year. That would be great. You know, and they call this rocket science for a reason. It's hard. Like you see all these other rocket companies going out of business. Like Rocket Lab is doing great. Uh, but a lot of the other companies are are in a lot of trouble and have gone out of business. Like there's a few that seem like they're about to get rolling. And there's a lot of stuff happening out of China. But still, just overall, this is an incredibly complicated, difficult industry to try and get into. And a lot of the times, you know, Jeff Bezos, even Elon Musk, they got into this because they're like sci-fi nerds, right? Both of them are, you know, sort of imagine this vision of humanity's solar system spanning future. And, you know, otherwise they would have just stuck to their other businesses and not gone into these. And both of them for the longest time were losing a lot of money in this. So it's complicated. It's hard. You're most likely to go out of business and anything that actually works, we should be quite happy about it. So I'm patient. New Glenn will fly again at some point or not, whatever. 
Did you know that you can watch the same video with no ads and get a bonus question over on Patreon completely for free? We call it Q&A Plus. And this week's bonus question is all about whether we have a moral obligation to spread life into an uninhabited universe. And I'll put a link to that in the show notes. All right, those are all the questions that we had this week. Thank you, everybody, who put your questions into the YouTube comments and everybody who joined us for the live stream show. Uh, we do that. We did that every Monday uh, at 5 p.m. somewhere around the world. But at the time that you're watching this now, we are on our summer live stream hiatus, which means that we aren't going to be doing the Monday question show or astronomy cast until the 1st of September or whenever the first Monday is. Anyway, um, now that doesn't mean that we're not going to be doing a bunch of stuff this summer. We're going to be doing a lot of interviews, Space Bites. We're going to be posting uh, overtime versions of our question shows. And then I've got a bunch of other live stream ideas that I'm going to be testing out. It's going to be sort of an experimental summer. So stay tuned for all of that. All right. I'm going to talk about some uh, an upcoming movie that I'm very excited about. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Andrew Gross, Bradley Griffin, Brian Bode, Caragrin, Chuck Hawkins, Commander Baylock, Sai Nielsen, David Gilton, and David Matz, Dustin Cable, Evan Pro, Greg Feely, Hudson Moore, James Clark, Jeremy Madden, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Marcel Smith, Michael Purcell, Monzo, Paul Robach, Rank Heidi, Robeck, Sean Sargent, Stephen Fowler Munley, Vlad Shiplin, and Wolfgang Klotz, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all our patrons. All your support means the universe to us. So yesterday, the time that I'm recording this, we got the new trailer for the Project Hail Mary movie. And this is based on a book written by Andy Weir a couple of years ago. And it's a great science fiction book. Uh, I don't want to go into too many details, but if you watch the trailer for Project Hail Mary, they kind of spoil the entire story. So I guess I can, which is that there's some problem with the sun and a guy who's not an astronaut has to go 11 light years away to try and figure out why the sun is being destroyed and meets an alien and uh, teams up with the alien to try and figure out the problem. So, uh, but if you've never read the book, I highly recommend it. Go back and read Project Hail Mary by Andy Weir. Now, Andy Weir is the same writer who did The Martian. And so if you haven't read The Martian, The Martian is great. And then, of course, the movie The Martian was also very good. And so the the Project Hail Mary looks looks good. I mean, it's got Ryan Gosling in it. And, you know, he was terrific in Barbie, <laughs> kind of stole the show. But, you know, he's a great actor. And uh, it really feels like the Project Hail Mary book. So I'm really looking forward to this as a movie. But this is just a reminder to, you know, if you haven't read Project Hail Mary, go and read it. If you haven't read The Martian, go and read that. And then go rewatch The Martian. I did that just a couple of, man, just a couple of months ago with, with my wife. And that's like the third time I've seen the movie. And it still holds up. It's a great movie. So uh, rewatch The Martian, read The Martian, read Project Hail Mary, and get ready uh, March 2026 uh, for the Project Hail Mary movie. All right, uh, we'll see you next time.